Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. We're back. We're back after our season four summer reruns. And we're ready, dying, really, to get started on season five. And boy, howdy, do we have a good one here. Just point out really fast oh, before yeah. we really get into it because we don't see him much. But it's worth it just for Stan's hair. His hair's glorious. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I don't know. I was distracted by a certain ponytail. <laughs> <laughs> I love the ponytail. <laughs> this week we're talking about season five, episode one, titled Hostile Takeover. This is probably the best episode name we've had in a long uh, it time. It really too. was like it really was apt to the episode. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was very hostile. <laughs> this whole episode was very hostile. <laughs> it originally premiered on November fourth, nineteen eighty-eight. It is directed by Ken Salars. Salars? I'm guessing here. <laughs> I don't know. Not like that. <laughs> this is the first episode he's written. Now, I think we're going to see a lot of this. It's going to be like, this is the first episode they've written. They'll also write five more episodes because they like, turned over the whole writing staff between seasons four and five. He has four more episodes coming, including Freefall, which is the finale. Well, that's good. That, that's a good sign, right? <laughs> he wrote the, he wrote both of them. Yeah, it'd be a bad sign if like Dick Wolf took over for the finale. <laughs> <laughs> it's directed by some guy named... Don, Dan, Dan Johnson, Don Johnson, Don Johnson, whatever this guy. He's like directed some lesser known episodes. Really? Like he directed this episode? By Hooker, by Crook, and Love at First Sight. I mean, he is like not even good episodes. Did like, he really direct this episode? Yes, he did. Wow. <laughs> that does not surprise me because you kind of get a very tough and strong Burnett in this episode. He definitely props himself up, you know. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> if you listen to those episodes, Back in the World by Hooker by Crook and Love at First Sight. It's like very friendly to Crockett episodes. Very true. I yeah. mean, he is directing himself. Very. So, you know. Uh, you know, at one point, I, I think I even made the comment of Crockett the Terminator. <laughs> oh, man. Worlds collide if Michael Bain and Don Johnson did a thing together. Oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> I would be there. <laughs> Make that happen, you guys. Get together. Come on. Before I get started, I can check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. Guys, everyone talks about, you see these signs up at diners or at coffee shops, like, live like it's the 90s. Don't, we don't have any Wi-Fi. Well, and as an 80s podcast, like, we love the 80s. So why don't we live the 80s for a day by our internet company tr having problems and us not having internet for over 24 hours? It was like the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't have cable in the 80s either. So. <laughs> <laughs> and because we did not need internet for the Nintendo. I, I will. Well, that's true. We, that. I, we did have a Nintendo when I was a kid. So the consoles back then didn't require you to have also some sort of live pro like a subscription mm -hmm. service. That you have to pay extra per year in order to play your games. Exactly. I'm not bitter about that at yeah, all. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we dealt with about a 24-hour outage of our internet. And also because we're a very frugal household. We also don't have any data on our cell phones. So we were literally... Well, I mean, not let's not let's be honest here. <laughs> Only two of us had data on their cell phones. And it was not me. It was it was Dominic and our teenage daughter. Me and Demetrius were out of, lu out of luck on that one. We don't have data. I love that. <laughs> you know, I, like I was fully expected you to say like it was me and Dominic. You know, like both the parents had internet, but the kids didn't. Nope. No, 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 no. No, it was Dominic and your teenage daughter who had yeah. the internet. You guys were just just sucks for you. Yeah, I was just out of luck. I had and I had nothing to do because I have nothing but my phone. I so I was reading. I mean, I had nothing to do. I write books and. You know, I took care of my my two year old. You know, come on. Now. Books. But, <laughs> How did you read books without without like a Kindle? Yeah, I don't read books on the Kindle. I'm an old fashioned girl. I only read books, paper books. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> they still make paper. Well, no more messing around. We got to get to Crockett's powerful t ponytail. <laughs> you got you. Are you telling me it's not a power <laughs> ponytail? That's a power ponytail. <laughs> I'm just saying that you can't tell he needs a ponytail when he has it out. He's like, he's willing I know, right? that to happen. He's <laughs> willing that to happen. Exactly. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let's go talk about this week's episode. When we open up, I'm like, Miami has a mass transit train? I had that too. It starts Monorail. Off with like <laughs> Monorail. <laughs> it's a fancy party club. Very ritzy. It's actually a birthday party. Sorry for Celeste. <sighs> Is it a costume Man. party? <laughs> 
No, I just it, white people, you let me down with your terrible, <laughs> terrible dancing again. <laughs> That's so funny, Dom. Come on, there's even a chick there, like there's even like a chick there, like twirling like a f- like fire baton. <laughs> it, it's just terrible, terrible dancing. And it, it's completely obvious this is the whitest group of people people <laughs> dancing, you know. There's an old man Just let me down, white people. <laughs> named Oscar and Celeste, his wife. Much younger wife. Much younger wife who are having quite the time on the dance floor. But do they ever say that's his wife? Are they actually married or no? They do say See, later He says something about her. Okay. Miguel does. I was confused because I thought they were just, you know, taking turns. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I, I mean, kind of. No. <laughs> I-, I thought maybe they had some schedule worked out that we weren't <laughs> as a viewer aware of. You know, like maybe Crockett got her on Wednesdays and Sundays and she was have- uh, the sons on Tuesdays. I have a question about that later in the episode, too, about a certain scene. So I'm going to save that one. Outside, a limo pulls up and a man orders his team of waiters to smell the air. <laughs> Wait a minute. They're waiters. <laughs> Back inside. The guns gave it away. Yeah. <laughs> Back inside, Oscar, the old man, is at the bar. He asks another man who we find out later is his son, who I thought was Lyle Lovett at first. <laughs> the hair. <laughs> I oh, could figure hair. out, like, did he not outgrow his prince phase? Or is he just like a <laughs> fancy pirate? I, oh, I said that, too. He looks like a fancy pirate. <laughs> he just, all he needed was, like, an eye patch. And, and you know, maybe a bedazzled parrot. <laughs> Miguel, the son, he's telling Oscar, his dad, that Elgato has been cutting into their sales. And they got to do something about it. Oscar says, I'm not here to cause any problems. We're not going to have any violence. That's not what we do. This is a party. We're here to have fun. And then Miguel goes over and says, mom's dead and kisses Celeste like right on the mouth. Well, because he says, give your mom a kiss. Like as a joke, the dad. The dad says, give Mm -hmm. your mom a birthday kiss. He goes, my mom's dead. And then he kisses Celeste passionately on the mouth. Oscar says that's lucky, but that's not lucky. That's sexual assault. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> she Oscar, clearly didn't enjoy that. No. Oscar says he needs to get a breath of fresh air. He goes outside, and this is when we see the power ponytail. Oh, it's a good ponytail. There's Sunny. Evil brunette. Yep. Evil Sunny <laughs> see, he is need, out there. He, he needs an eye patch. That way we can know with the eye patch <laughs> and the ponytail that it's evil Sunny and not regular Sunny. You know what would have been better, too? A mustache. A mustache for evil Sunny. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I don't think a Don Johnson can grow a mustache. <laughs> I know he had one. We're sorry, Don. We didn't mean that. I'm just kidding. (laughs) He had one of that. He had a beer. No, I'm sure he can. I'm joking. I'm joking. I swear. (laughs) That man's all man. He can grow a mustache. (laughs) In this scene, we pretty much see that Burnett, he's getting pretty close to the boss, calling him Mr. C and kind of his confidant. Like he's gotten in pretty good with these guys. Back inside, Kate comes out. He's got a male stripper in it who's working his ass off. He's putting on a fantastic (laughs) show. In the kitchen, the 4th Brigade Waiter Division comes in with their guns and opens fire on the party. And the cook, the whole time they go walking by him with their guns, there's a chef in the kitchen, and he could not care less about four or five dudes with Uzis walking by. Yeah, he's busy. He's, He's working on his dessert or something. Does not give a damn. So they come out, and they start opening fire. On the party, Sonny saves Oscar, goes badass, jumps around the whole restaurant, kills two of them, and then the guards take off running. And Melissa, you were saying, unfortunately, there's one man goes down. The stripper. <laughs> <laughs> right away, oh. he gets shot. Like, poor guy. You're like, oh, no, not the stripper. <laughs> I'm like, the stripper. Watch out for the stripper. <laughs> Just working his way through nursing school. Exactly. It's already degrading enough that you have to jump out of a cake. <laughs> so I don't know, I was just, this is where i thought of evil burnett as the terminator because these guys got uzis he's jumping around with a magnum climbing on the cake and <laughs> quickly takes two of them down ponytail powers brother <laughs> <laughs> and then we go to the opening credits before you move on to the rest of the episode like check in and see what's up with the guest stars and this week's has a lot of people that are like i think i know who that person is but you didn't really <laughs> 
Let's get started with guest stars. We'll start with Deborah. Fewer, fewer. She plays Celeste. And all right. So funny coincidence. Her last name is F E U E R. And in our music, our first band is Underworld, which is made up of two guys and then the rest of a band who was whose name was a symbol, but was but people called them fewer. F E U E R. So <laughs> weird. And and there's no relation between the two. Weird. From what I can tell. <laughs> And there's also someone named so. Brewer that's later in the guest stars, too. Yes, yes. And so, and there are more coincidences that we will find in the guest stars. But let's just jump in with Deborah, who's playing Sest. She's been in a few movies you might know. She was in Moment by Moment, The Hollywood Nights, To Live and Die in L.A. And she was also in Homeboy with her then-husband, Mickey Rourke. Mm. Oh. I was going to talk about how she was married to Mickey Rourke. I might, I was going to even mention that her brother Ian plays professional soccer. But I got distracted by her TV credits. Now, she did one to two episodes, uh, appearances of your standard, in an episode of Crime Story, because that's required if you're in Vice. <laughs> she did an episode of Dukes of Hazzard, an episode of Fantasy Island. She also did an episode, and this is what distracted me, of a show called Magruder and Loud. It was a 1985 ABC sitcom about two married cops during a period of anti-fraternization among the force. And so, and one of the parts of the plot was that one of their houses, I guess, there was a grandfather clock with a secret door so the other one could sno- sneak in. <laughs> so I kind of want to see this show just to see how epically <laughs> bad this is. And apparently it lasted in a season on ABC. Only one season. So, <laughs> um, I w- so our next guest star is Joe Santos, and he plays Oscar Carrera. Uh, he's probably best known for playing Sergeant Dennis Bake- uh, Becker in the Rockford Files. A little background, he's a former football player. He played football at the at Fordham College, and he even went semi-pro before, start, before he started acting. When he started acting, he really struggled getting roles at first. He took a lot of blue-collar jobs until his friend, Al Pacino, huh. helped get him a role in 1971 movie, The Panic in Needle Park. Wow. Nice to have fr- friends like Al Pacino. Yeah, yeah, you know, that comes in He's handy. He's a little a friend, you know. <laughs> Some of the other notable roles he's played was Lieutenant Frank Herper in Hardcastle and McCormick, which sounds like another amazing cop show. <laughs> he played Norman Davis in Me and Max, Max spelled with two X's. <laughs> also played Domingo Rivera on AKA Pablo. And if you don't know him from that, from all of those big name TV shows, <laughs> also Angelo Gurepe in The Sopranos. Ah. Oh, you know that one. Okay. <laughs> All right, so weird weird fact of uh, guest stars. From 1978 to 1980, Joe Santos appeared on CBS's The Match Game. He sat in the upper left-hand corner and provided a comic foil to Brett Summers. So essentially, Joe Santos, uh, before his accurate really took off, one of his roles was to sit in the audience and engage the host of The Match Game. Or, or heckle. Some of his other movies are The Last Boy Scout, The Postman, and Mo Money. Our next guest stars, John Polito, who plays El Gato, character actor and voice artist who has amassed over 220 TV and film credits over the last 35 years. His most notable roles include Detective Steve Crossetti in the first two seasons of Homicide Life on the Street and Phil Bartolini on the first season of Crime Story. Jeez, Crime Story. <laughs> I heard that. So the thing, funny story about the side life on the street, he actually got killed off in season three. Didn't see, uh, because he actually complained because they kind of pulled him off the show or he got less screen time in season two because the ratings were bad. And so they brought in a female character. And so he complained about his less screen time. And so they killed him off. Uh, they just, he just committed suicide randomly in season three. 
<laughs> he'd be okay because he would end up hooking up with the Cohen brothers and end up appearing in five of their movies. Miller's Crossing, Barton Fink, The Big Lebowski, and a few others. Damn. And of course, in 2000, The Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle. <laughs> Our next guest star is Anthony Cravello. He plays Miguel Carrera. He's an actor and singer and has won numerous theater awards. He's the guy that we were saying looks like the fancy pirate. (laughs) So he's also written several scripts and songs. So his film credits include Crocodile Dundee 2, Spellbinder, Monster Mash, the movie, (laughs) Alien (laughs) Avengers, Independence Day, Alien Hunter, and Behind the Candelabra. One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> oh, more like aliens, 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 and then Liberace. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Liberace. The liver. I, I guess it's not too far out in left field. He was also in a movie called Material Girls with Hillary and Haley Duff. <laughs> wow. So he's pretty much been on everything. Uh, uh, as far as TV goes, he's been on everything from Star Trek to Seinfeld. And also moonlighted as a sports radio host and a ring announcer and commentator for ESPN2's Kickboxing Championship. Our next guest star, Paul Lazar, who plays David Sugarman. Vice was his first TV credit. His movie credits include Silence of the Lambs, Philadelphia, Streamer, The Host, Snowpiercer, Manchurian Candidate. So he's actually been in some pretty good movies. Once again, I was distracted by the fact that he co-wrote a 2010 film called Bass Ackwards. <laughs> let that one sink in. It has a 5.9 out of 10 on IMBD. <laughs> That's about as much information as I can find. <laughs> Our next uh, guest star is Victor Argo, who plays Comandante Salazar. Uh, and he's actually got a pretty interesting story. He began as a stage actor in the 60s. He met and participated in the happening movement with Yoko Uno. Whatever the hell that means. <laughs> Go on then to befriend a then fledgling actor named Harvey Keitel. Uh, Some random guy. Yeah, I mean, random guy. Yeah, exactly. Totally random. Uh, So, and then in 1977, one of the founding members of the Riverside Shakespeare Company of New York's Upper West Side. He's known mostly for playing tough guys and tough bad guys in movies. Some of the movies like Taxi Driver, King of New York, Bad Lieutenant, True Romance. But he also has a softer side as he was in Coyote Ugly and J-Lo's Angel Eyes. <laughs> Shortly before his death, he realized his lifelong dream of performing on Broadway when he was cast as Santiago, a cigar factory owner in the Pulitzer Prize winning drama Anna in the Tropics. Our last guest star is Matt Frewer, who plays Cliff King, and he is an actor, singer, voice artist, and comedian. Start to fame is he played Mass Headroom, which was like a TV movie that spun out into the Max Headroom show. So let me see if I can explain. He he played a fictional AI character. So he was made to look like he was computer animated, even though it was just four hours of grueling makeup. And basically they flipped him into being like, so the TV movie, he was the first computer generated TV host. And then they flipped it into him being like a TV VJ for the BBC's Channel 4. So he would kick off, he would send off like the music and and do interviews. But it, it's weird because it's kind of um. Do you remember the? Do you remember Phil Hartman's character in Pee Wee Herman? Yeah. His character was kind of like that. It was just like a floating head. It was more like yawn in nineties mm-hmm. or eighties. What's funny about Sorry. the Max Headroom deal is people might remember it more for the TV hijacking where someone wore a Max Headroom mask than it is for actual Max Headroom. He actually reprised the role in the Adam Sandler 2015 movie Pixels. All of three uh, people and saw uh, that. Just a few... I was going to say, but nobody saw that. Uh-huh. <laughs> he also played Dr. Leakey in the sci-fi drama Orphan Black. This is also the so... person that I thought was the evil businessman in Billy Madison and then found out, no, he is, in fact, Max Headroom and not Billy's yes. arch enemy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he was in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. 
It was yeah, also was... in the 2004 remake of Dawn of the Dead, Moloch the Mystic, a retired villain in the movie Watchmen, and currently he plays Carnage in the Netflix series Altered Carbon. Oh, interesting. When we come back from the opening credits, we're at the precinct. The team is talking about the party. Three people had died, and Tub says, it looks like a war starting, like there's a crime boss, drug lord war that is happening right now. On the computer, speaking of Max Headroom, there's some nice pixel art images <laughs> of Jose Manolo appearing on the screen. That doesn't seem like a standard Dude. program for the police to have. <laughs> Who put that in there? It, it, it's almost like they're meeting the cast of Fantasy Island or something. <laughs> you know, it's like a bunch of headshots going by. <laughs> they tell him the story that Jose Manolo was assassinated by Oscar. And then Elgato is now trying to get revenge, who was Jose Manolo's brother, to kill all of Oscar's family. And so that's where we bring us here. They still haven't seen anything from Crockett. They lost track of him after Manolo from last season died. But they know he's still out there. They ask Lieutenant Castillo about it. And he kind of gets a sad face on. And he almost goes like, Sonny's gone. He's gone forever. <laughs> In that time when Castillo is telling them about Sonny, like, yeah, we lost track of him. And, and we're not able to keep up with where he's at. He also says, hey, you all have to still do your jobs, and you all know how I feel about Sonny. He said, you all know how I feel about Sonny, but we all have to do our jobs. How does anyone know how you feel about anybody, Castillo? <laughs> <laughs> you never let on you have feelings at all. I feel like I'm a robot. <laughs> well, if you come by work, if you come by after work, when all the lights are shut off, you'll see him in the back in like the <laughs> locker room crying. Yep. <laughs> Tubbs follows Dad into his office, and he says that, they talked to some of the staff that works at the restaurant, and they put the sh one of the shooters as a 160-pound, 5'9". Sandy blonde Sandy hair. Sandy blonde hair. <laughs> kind of dreamy. With a ponytail of glory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounded like he was someone you wanted to date. He was like, Sandy brown skin. Dad just turns to Tub says, we need a man on the pounds. inside. I can take him. <laughs> <laughs> he also says that he was shooting military style. Because <laughs> Crockett. That How do you determine that? I don't know. How did the kitchen staff who recognized him? <laughs> that. The guy who was plating that food that had that couldn't be bothered. He's like, yeah, yeah, I saw him. He was military style. The, he had a military pony. He tail. rolled across the cake. That was very military. At an Oscar, Sonny's just sitting outside looking fabulous. Yes. Celeste walks by and takes a nice look. And Cliff, the assassin, as we found out in the previous scene, who works for Oscar, calls him out. I'm like, yeah, it looks nice, doesn't it? <laughs> Inside, all the leaders of the Carrera gang are meeting, and they want to buy a new fleet of boats and planes to move drugs faster. Oscar, though, is like, that's a lot of money. I don't know if I want to spend all that. Sonny, what do you think? He's like, planes <laughs> get shot down. He's like, okay, sounds good. Let's go with the boats then. And Miguel is not happy about that. Oscar's like, damn it, boy, just sell the coke like I tell you to. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone leaves except for Sonny and Miguel. And Miguel says... I don't understand why my dad doesn't understand that Elgato is a big threat. We need to make a move against him because Elgato is just going to keep getting stronger and more brazen. And Sonny says, hey, like, I don't know if you knew this, but I'm willing to murder anyone for I, any reason. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> Let's murder everyone. <laughs> so first, Miguel throws out that he, he says that Oscar raped us. And I'm confused a little bit. How did he rape them? <laughs> I know that was a little harsh of a description, I think. Kind That's the a, right word yeah, to describe oh, what's going on. I thought that too. Dula Burnett. Oh, well, you know, I've got some ideas on how to kill some people. I've jotted some stuff down. Come by my room. I did a diagram. We'll talk about it. As he leaves, Cliff is waiting outside. He's been listening to the whole conversation. Cliff's like, Hey, I won't say anything if you let me, you know, wet my beak on this one. <laughs> yeah, <will> exactly. Uh... <laughs> I also like to double cross people and murder. I love the fact that Burnett immediately shoots him down, though, and says, I don't do partners. I kind of th thought I knew that. Like, I'm <laughs> sure. I knew Crockett wasn't very good with partners. This is, I mean, Tubbs is like his seventh. <laughs> he didn't even know who Tubbs is. <laughs> At the precinct late night, Tubbs comes in to talk to Dad. Homicide just called. An army train got Shanghai. <laughs> and they got away with M16 and Stingers. They don't know who hit it, what, whether it was the Carreras or if it was the Manolos. They want Tubbs to go find out what was going on. And again, John, like you were saying, this is Dad just sitting in the back 
not in his office, in some other room, like crying <laughs> into his yes. hands. So <laughs> that's walking in. This is this is what I was foreshadowing too. So question here: Is this the lieutenant crying in the dark, or is this just another Tuesday night at the office after hours? Like, does he just hang out every Tuesday night in the locker room in the dark, or? <laughs> Is this a special occasion? <laughs> Meanwhile, two men are having a nice steam. I don't know what is going on in love. <laughs> it is it is it's something beautiful, Melissa, and Crockett <laughs> ruins it. I, I well, should say Burnett ruins it. I would say that, but one of the men, the blonde guy, looks like he doesn't like it. So I'm confused on that that portion of if it. If you break this scene down like frame by frame, mm-hmm. one man comes in and stands over another one. The, in the steam room with no yeah. a towel, just towels on. The standing man puts his arm out onto the sitting man's shoulder. And the sitting man takes him, turns his wrist backwards, like forcibly his hand backwards to get him off the shoulder. And then Sonny comes walking up as there's a voiceover happening saying, if you want to hit Elgato, you got to hit someone that's close to him. And then Sonny shoots the standing man as the sitting man just watches in shock. And then he shoots the sitting man, and that's the end of the scene. I'm thinking now that, I, that we're re, we're re, dis, re discussing this and hashing this out. Maybe the the sitting man or the blonde guy knew that Sunny was in there, and that's why he was that's looking. Like, he looked like he was a deer in headlights the entire time. His eyeballs were huge, and he was like, maybe that's why he looked like that because he knew Sunny was back there, and he didn't know how to say like, "Hey, there's someone back there, <laughs> <laughs> and he's got a gun. <laughs> Don't touch my wee wee while we're here." <laughs> <laughs> Later at the mortuary, the cat is crying over his dead friend in his gold jacket and fabulous sunglasses. Okay, that was the weirdest, like, funeral <laughs> attire I've ever seen at everybody. <laughs> he had those gold glasses and that gold jacket, and, and then you know, he has no hair, so he can't do anything crazy with it. But all the other guys look like they belong in an 80s band or something. <laughs> Their hair was, like, gigantic, and they were wearing, like... I don't know. Their shirts were open. I don't know. I don't know. That was not awake. I don't know what that was. <laughs> the cat slams the casket closed, turns to his people, and says, I will make sure that the Carreras pay for this by killing their entire family. And the members of Rat shake their heads in unison in <laughs> they agreement. Agree. <laughs> 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 At an Oscars, Miguel goes over and kisses his mom's leg. I don't know what the heck is going on with those Free two. foot massage. <laughs> He's just giving out free foot massages. Anyone hanging out by the pool? <laughs> Oscar comes over and calls out Miguel for ordering the hit on Elgato's men. They argue. First, he tells Celeste to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> and Celeste is like, I was here first, dick. <laughs> like, I just put on some canola oil. Like, seriously. <laughs> Then Oscar th- beat up his kid, his wussy kid. <laughs> well, they argue about it, and then the old man says, come on, hit me. If you can do something about it, then hit me. Go for it. And then he doesn't. He just storms away, and then you see Cliff and Sonny that are watching, and Cliff pays Burnett a $100 bill. It's like, yeah, you were right. That was He was going to back out. He was going to chicken out before it happened. Meanwhile, in a limo, Elgato is in the sweatiest limo that has ever existed. <laughs> The steam limo, actually. Dude, he, <laughs> he is sweating fiercely, and the other guy is not at all. What is going on here? I think it's wardrobe choices. I, that's what I'm thinking. All that pleather. All the pleather is making him sweaty. <laughs> yeah, the other guy's like just sitting there chilling, like, not sweating at all. It, and Elgato looks like he's melting. <laughs> it's like when Tubbs and Crockett are in a scene together and Tubbs is all sweaty. <laughs> you can't figure it out. Like, why are you so sweaty? <laughs> Elgato is telling the man, I want you to kill Burnett. The man says that he found out that Burnett was the trigger man. And Elgato says, you kill him, I'll make you partner. Out at Oscars, Miguel and Oscar are arguing again. Oscar is saying, we can't take a hit out on Elgato. We can't make a move. That's not our style. That's not what we do. We need to be more calculated than this. And Miguel is saying, you're weak and afraid. Miguel leaves. Oscar tells Cliff to go get Sonny. They have a meeting with Mr. Cooper. Who was wearing some kind of tourist outfit. (laughs) Like he just got back from safari or something. I don't know. (laughs) So let's stop for just a minute right here. Of all the people who's going to be a man on the inside for Vice, it can't be the man that Sonny attempted to kill while he worked for Manolo, can it? Well, apparently it can. (laughs) What are they going to say in there, Stan? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he can't go in there with that hairdo he's got going on. 
What about the girls? Can, I know, can't the, the girls pretend to be? I think Gina would have triggered his memory. They would have sent her in. I'm saying. I mean, he's <laughs> he's seen her naked. <laughs> and if she didn't trigger his memory, memory, at least she can shoot him, and then it wouldn't be, well, <laughs> him shooting tubs. True story. I mean, she does have a history of shooting people she slept with. So, you know. Yes. It's Sunny's still out there. Like, yeah. yeah. You know, she, she has to close the book on that one. Yeah. <laughs> nope. No, so, so I love so Sonny's re reaction too because his reaction to seeing Cooper, he's very suspicious, but he almost has this. You see him trying to process. I used to know a black guy about your height <laughs> named Cooper. He, he liked veggie burgers for some reason. <laughs> Tubbs is surprised to see Sonny too. They because like there's this feeling like Sonny might be involved in this, but they weren't 100 percent sure. So they're surprised to see each other. And you're right, John. Sonny is super suspicious. He's like, like, how come I don't remember you? We, yeah, I worked for Manola. How come I never saw you? And Tubbs is like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, uh, let's yeah, but, but, uh, <laughs> let's just skip over that. Dude, he's totally going to shoot Tubbs again. After a little bit in the meeting, they Sonny is escorting Cooper out. Cooper starts asking Sonny or Tubbs, I should say. Starts asking Sonny a bunch of questions. Like, are you married? Are you from Florida? And Sonny starts to have major flashbacks. Mm -hmm. Then he starts to see. He like sees uh, Catherine um uh K katie caitlin that's her name <laughs> caitlin sees caitlin and then he sees all the times that tubbs has told him he loves him <laughs> i know <laughs> that actually he never so random kid <laughs> yeah oh timmy johnny i don't know hey by Back the way the, this, I, I could not tell if that or during that meeting with cooper did he have an accent like half the time and then the other half the time <laughs> yeah. he was just talking normal <laughs> Yeah, like, I thought like for what? a minute he switched on and off because I was like, oh, he's Jamaican. Oh, oh, okay. We're going yeah. on the Jamaican route because then he wasn't Jamaican for a minute. I was like, <laughs> so later that night, nothing happens here. Cooper leaves. Sonny is still confused as what's happening. So later that night, Celeste is dancing around in the backyard to no one in particular while Sonny and Miguel are just watching. They're playing like some game or backgammon. something. Backgammon. Yeah, they're playing backgammon and having a drink. Sonny gets up to go to get another drink. And Miguel, thinking about his mom, that's that essentially no, what she is. But he has no, like, willpower. Like, I mean, she's just out there dancing. She wasn't naked or anything. Like, I don't get it. <laughs> He's like, no, I have to go. I have to be sweaty and go out there with my pirate haircut and try and seduce her. <laughs> <laughs> he goes out there and he starts making out with his mom. Yeah, it's gross. Well, she's not really his mom, we should say. But, yeah, I mean, but still, come on now. Yeah, you I wouldn't know. make out with your stepmom, would you? Uh, No. <laughs> <laughs> the next day on the beach, Sonny is watching like some people out on the water. Maybe the Carreras are out on their boat or something. That's why he's there. I couldn't figure out at first why he was there, but then you see... Just relaxes him. <laughs> well, yeah, later on you figure out why he's there. Yeah. yeah. Then you see Celeste come out of the water. Now, the whole time he's having, like, flashbacks. And it's, again, it's more flashbacks of him here in Tubbs, how much in Tubbs <laughs> proclaiming his love for Sonny. She comes up and kisses Sonny and asks how she did. Now, hold on a second. I know where you're going to go with this, but I, I have the answer. This, so Melissa's going to set it straight, but I'm going to say how I felt when I was watching it. This sounds. This sounded an awful lot like there was a threesome happening the <laughs> night before with Miguel, Sonny, and Celeste. She was like, "How was I last night?" She's like, you ain't got Miguel's heartbeat thumping. And she's like, "Yeah, I know. I did. Like, you really like that kind of stuff, don't you?" And I'm like, "Oh my god, things are real <laughs> freaky at the Carrera." I hey. got all excited. <laughs> In reality, is when you start to realize that Sonny is like he's a, he's a puppet master pulling the strings. He set that up. He's saying like. She's saying, how was my performance? Like, how did I do luring him outside by dance? Because apparently all you have to do is dance. Like, <laughs> women, all you have to do is dance around a pool and then men will flock to you. That's what they're saying. So that's what yeah, you mean I mean by her performance. Like, that's what you, that she's saying that. Like, how did I do? And, you know, and then she starts talking about how she only does it for him. I'm doing this all for you. So it's a, there's a plan here. Yeah. And, it's, it's clear. And, and honestly, this is the point in the episode where I realized that Bert, that Sonny Burnett is a devious bastard, and he's yeah. a much better criminal than he was ever a cop. This yeah. is the TV show exactly. we should have been watching from the beginning, because yeah, this guy is cunning. ruthless. <laughs> he, 
there's no way that Crockett could have schemed all this stuff up in his mind. <laughs> yes. I mean, essentially, Burnett right now is, is about to get a father and son crime boss to kill each other so that he can take over the drug business while banging, I guess, both of their girlfriends. Their mom slash <laughs> wife. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, like, good job, Burnett, man. Like, you're a good criminal. You should have been that guy a long time ago. <laughs> and just to solidify, like, how evil and devious his plan is, he then goes that night with Cliff out to meet all the mules, essentially, all the people who move it on the ground, not the dealers, but the people who drive the trucks and do the deliveries. And the planes and drop yeah. off stuff. He meets with all of them mm -hmm. and says, you've all been getting paid too little. You partner with me. I'm going to make you millionaires. And I'm like, yep, yeah, sounds good. So I'm happy you're bringing down what we all know as our, re as our regular drug lords right now. This guy's going to set it right. He just undercut. I, I, I want to make this scene as, as important as it is. Because in my opinion, if over yes. the last three episodes of the Amnesia arc, this is the most important scene because mm -hmm. he just kneecaps yes. every single one of the drug lords in Florida. Yeah. Yes. And this, I was going to say, this is one of the, like, this is probably the most important scene of the episode because it's going to linger for the rest of the series. We get to meet communist Burnett and he wants to start a dope dealer union. And, and the meeting goes well. Uh, we kind of fade, fade out as they start talking about health benefits and 401k plans. But <laughs> oh, we have basically established that Sonny's plan is to basically murder, lie, and cheat his way, take over the head of the crime union as kind of like their Jimmy Hoffa position. And he's doing it by basically eliminating eliminating all of the drug he uh, the heads of all the cartels and uniting all the people that work for them. Like this is a uh, a, a evil villain plan. Like he he literally Melissa does need the mustache so he can kind of play <laughs> with it. This is beyond like anything we've seen in this show because he's not just going to say kill the head of a of a cartel and then usurp their throne. He is actually killing the heads of the cartels and also consolidating all of the routes to move the drugs under his control. Yeah, it's all strategy. Mm -hmm. He's got a strategic plan to take over all of, not just Carreras and Manolo, all of it. He wants to have an empire of it. That's how evil he is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And as we find out in the next scene, it is, his plan is working flawlessly. Yes, because Miguel comes in to see his mom. In bed. Who, by just, the way, doesn't really like him. Let's just put it this way. She's grossed out by him. Yes. It's clear. She's not We're she's all not attracted. grossed out by him. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, everyone is. <laughs> Oscar comes in and sees that Miguel has moved in and is now kissing his wife. You know, his new wife is making out with him. His son is doing that. You know what I'm saying? And rips Miguel off of her. There's a tussle. In the process, Miguel had gotten his hand on Celeste's gun. He pulls out the gun shoots and kills his father, thus ending Oscar's reign as the Carrera cr cartel leader. And Miguel is in no way able to handle that role. Oh, no. He starts crying immediately, bawling his eyes out like a little wuss. <laughs> this is where he kind of takes a little longer on the plan. We go from there, and we go to where I guess it's kind of his Oscar's wake or something. And we see that Miguel's still all distraught. Oh, and I'm thinking in my head that, you know, at this point, Burnett can just cap Miguel at any point and take over the organization. No one's going to question. Everyone's already on his side. And so it's like the whole time, Miguel's just crying like a crybaby. Just think of like one bullet, man. Just you just pop him right now. And we can get this all over with. Move on to phase two. Yeah, because he's already flipped everybody. Yeah. Two of these last scenes, something has bothered me with some of the lines that were written for Celeste. That scene on the beach where she comes up and kisses Crockett or Burnett. She says, Don't ever turn me around. I wasn't sure exactly she was meaning <laughs> with that. And then in this scene at the wake, she says, he's like a lizard. I'm thinking, <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? Uh, I knew what she meant. He looks like a lizard. Like his skin is gross. And okay, I'm going to really, <laughs> I better stop. <laughs> he looks like a lizard. He's like, he's like swirly and slimy and gross. Like, yeah, I don't she know. says that she doesn't want to be there with him. She doesn't trust him, like what he's going to do. And Sonny says, 
hey, look, we're almost to the end of the line here. If you just hold on for a little bit longer, I'm going to have, I'm going to be the kingpin. I'm going to pull all the strings. Yeah, basically, though, he's like, you suck it up and you do all the work. And I'm going to get all the, I'm going to reap all the benefits. She's the one that has to, like, touch that creepy looking <laughs> pirate, puffy haired <laughs> lizard <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> so Sonny takes off in a helicopter and he lands at a airstrip to meet with Comandante Emilio Salazar. Dude, Comand- but that be big time. Got his own damn helicopter waiting for him. He's already <laughs> rolling. <laughs> Salazar is wanted in the U.S. and he knows that Sonny is in charge of the Carrera cartel now. I, I mean, news known. travels fast. Yeah. <laughs> he, he got the email. <laughs> Sonny wants access to their airstrips because, you know, when he said earlier about the airplanes being a problem, he didn't really mean that. He's going to control a whole bunch of different airplanes. And he wants access to the airstrip that the Comandante has control over. Comandante says, I got a problem with Elgato. You take care of that. We'll have some shipping lanes opened up for you, including by truck across the border. Yeah, he actually kind of gives up pretty easily. Burnett's like, hey, we're expanding. He's like, cool, man. Hey, <laughs> just get this Elgato guy to stop calling me. He's a drama queen. <laughs> so, but I love how he tells them they're going to transport the coke, too, in, in like produce trucks. Mm-hmm. Oh, so, I mean, so they're hiding coke in avocado trucks. So it's <laughs> it's all the millennials' fault. Damn it! <laughs> he says lettuce and strawberries. That's what he says: lettuce and strawberries, because they won't check those things. <laughs> oh, but they'll check avocados. <laughs> Squeeze them. <laughs> <laughs> At the Carrera house, Sunny lands back, and he's going to go talk to Cliff. They're getting ready for the next deal, which is with Cooper later that night. And Celeste comes over and says, "Where the hell have you been? This is leaving me alone, not taking care of me. I've been waiting for you all this time." I mean, I didn't mean that. How about we just go back no. to the bedroom? Well, that's what he says. <laughs> She's telling you, like, nobody treats Celeste this way. Burnett gets immediately horny, picks her up, carries her, like, <laughs> quick, someone put a sock on the door. You know? <laughs> He's so carefree now that he got Junior to murder his dad. You know? Like, he has no respect for Miguel at all. I'm going to fly around in your helicopter. I'm going to bang your woman while you sit here and cry because you shot your daddy. <laughs> At the precinct, Tubbs and Castillo are talking. Castillo says, you're going with backup. Like, that's the way it is. Sonny can't be trusted. This is too important. You can't go alone. And Tubbs is saying, I can flip Sonny. And you don't want to blow this. If you send backup, we're going to be seen. It's going to blow this deal. Like, we need this to open this totally up. And if Sonny doesn't flip, if he doesn't remember me, then I'll do what I have to do. And yeah, he's dad like, he, re, re, relents. He says, you're right. He he might have be go too far gone, and I'll know, and I'll take care of it. Yeah, Tubbs got to handle it. At a, the Sonny Burnett household, which I'm going to call it now because <laughs> it's not the Carrera household anymore. Sonny's leaving after some um, special Sex. time with Celeste. <laughs> he's like not even dressed. No, and Miguel grabs Celeste by the hair and holds a gun to her. He says, I, I know what you're up to, man. I'm not dumb. Like, we, well... Actually, this has been you going are, on for a while. You're pretty stupid, actually. <laughs> you are pretty stupid, yeah. And Dude, and the luckiest thing happens. So lucky. So the guy that was there to kill Burnett, uh, Sonny he trips and falls or, <laughs> or, or something. And, and luckiest thing, guy that was there to kill Burnett, bam, shoots Miguel and kills him. Just, It's so weird how it worked out that way. But they were there to kill Burnett because Elgato said he knew that that's who the trigger man was. I mean, he also said he'd kill all of the Carrera family. He was going to take care of all of them. But he knew that Sonny was the trigger man. But he just, Celeste just happens to get away at the right time. And Sonny dropped a quarter or something. So he had to like <laughs> jump down to get it. And then, yeah. Bam, Miguel's dead. But then he tries to shoot Sonny. And then yeah. Sonny, Sonny shoots him, right? Yeah. So, but I think Sonny's now, you know, in military position. <laughs> shooting position <laughs> on the ground and he easily shoots him in the bushes you know no big deal but yeah super lucky and cliff comes over my favorite part is that cliff comes over and says well i guess that takes care of miguel for us <laughs> <laughs> yeah dude no one like miguel miguel <laughs> no one liked you or but- or your stupid perm mullet <laughs> <laughs> so now to the final scene of the episode it's time for the cooper meet tub shows up he goes into the lighthouse he sees that only sunny is there says what happened to miguel and sunny says oh he fell on some stairs <laughs> okay <laughs> doesn't take long in this scene for i think tubs to get the feeling that sunny uh, is more ruthless than he thought or well, tubs burnett tubs, 
sees his opportunity. Like, it's just me and him. There's no one else in this lighthouse. So he walks over and says, Sonny, don't you remember? It's me, Rico. And Sonny starts having a whole bunch of flashbacks. Again, more flashbacks of Tubbs telling him how much he loves him. Lots of laughing. (laughs) Yeah, like grabbing and laughing and joking. It's like, I love you, man. And Sonny comes back out of it and he has this smirk on his face. Like, oh, God. Like, yeah, Rico. Rico no, Tubbs. Tubbs. He goes, Tubbs, yeah. The police officer I attempted to murder when <laughs> I worked with Manolo. And then you hear a couple gunshots and freeze frame, episode over. Yeah. But he doesn't have a flashback of that where he tries to shoot Tubbs. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. He just recreated it for himself. <laughs> this is a really good episode. And they do a really good job of setting up just like how out of control Sonny is. And this really feels like, like he is too far. He is too gone. There's nothing that they can do to stop this now. They're just going to have to kill or arrest, at least arrest him. But they're probably not going to be able to take him down. They're going to have to kill him. I was going to say they're vice. They're going to yeah. kill him. <laughs> there, there's no I, I arresting mean, I, him. I, he has to be murdered. <laughs> I think, I'm pretty sure at this point Burnett is equal to or or greater than villain than Frank who killed his wife. Yeah. That's true. I mean, look at all the people he's killed. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. He is so far gone. Like, what is anyone actually going to be able to do unless they can break the amnesia? Then even then, look at how many people he's killed. Yeah, that'll be okay. That all comes out in the wash. (laughs) Don't worry about it. Who would ever want to work with him again? Look at his track record. He says he doesn't work with partners. He just (laughs) shot his seventh partner for the second time. (laughs) I don't know. This... This is such a great setup for what the final episode of the Amnesia story arc is going to be. I don't know where they mm-hmm. go from here. And I know like most of us, yeah, it gets crazy. Uh, but talk about this week's music first before we get too far into like what our thoughts are as what's going to happen. Let's go break down th- this week's music. All right, John, we're back. Season five. We have new showrunner. We have new writers. I wonder, I have no idea what to expect with music this season what do you got for us okay so we we are gonna start off with someone that we've already talked about once before we're gonna talk about under the radar by underworld you might remember them from previous vice episode segment when they did the song glory glory in the episode badge of dishonor Uh, a little reminder the principal members were carl hyde and rick smith they also partnered with uh dj darren emerson from 91 to 99 also toured with a darren prince as a tour member in 05 and 016 but mostly they are known because of the titles uh, the biggest song off of their second album the second album named second toughest infants by the way <laughs> yes their song born slippy period nux was featured <laughs> in them now was featured on this uh, tra- on the soundtrack for the film train spotting it blew up and it blew up for them and they they're actually considered one of the well one born slippy period nux is considered one of the best dance <laughs> tracks of of the decade so mind you that was the 90s kind of the uh the the bottom tier of decades as far as decades go you know nostalgia is high right now and everything is nostalgia based and i will just say just warn people like the 80s has been popular and the 80s coming back has been a thing and now everyone's starting to hype up the 90s like we don't want to go back to that time that was a silly time no. There's no reason to go back to the no, 90s. The, the 90s was terrible. The, the 90s started with Vanilla Ice and the MC Hammer. We went from there. Okay? <laughs> the, we don't need to revisit that. We already talked about Underworld once. A few things I might have left out the first time. In the disco scene in the movie Vanilla Sky, they featured Underworld's 93 hit Rez. Also made the soundtrack for Danny Boyle's 2006 film Sunshine. And actually, I watched that mm-hmm. recently. That's a really good sci-fi flick. Thing is something else unique. Let's see. Uh, in 2007, at the Eject Festival in Athens, Greece, Approximately 30 masked Greek anarchists stormed the stadium, and Rick Smith was amongst those injured during the ensuing violence, and it actually Damn. forced them to, to cancel their remaining shows. Now, I find this interesting because the, the, 
the anarchists stormed the stadium during the Beastie Boys set. And I'm just wondering, was that what set them off? Why, uh, why are anarchists storming a Beastie Boys concert? It seems odd. The last thing I will throw out there, too, is that Born Slippy, period, Nux, two X's. <laughs> <laughs> came in at number 65 in the 2009 poll put out there by Triple J on Triple J's hottest 100 of all time. If you want to know who Triple J is, well, the people who voted in the poll, the Australian public. So Australia <laughs> loves you, baby. <laughs> so thinking, speaking of popular in Australia, let's talk about our second artist, second artist, Tony Childs, with the song Walk and Talk Like Angels. Tony Childs began in music in 1979 by filling in for singer Terry N uh, Nunn during so several live shows with the band Berlin. She would go from there, and her next notable band she would join would be Tony and the Movers. Tony and the Movers toured for two years but never released an album. But the band was made up with a couple pretty big-name members. They had... Jack Sherman, who would later go on to join the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Mickey Steele, who would become a member of the Bengals. Hmm. She would leave that band and perform a little bit in around L.A. under the name Nadia Kopich. Uh, After a while, she would approach Island Music and to basically told them, hey, sign me. They did sign her in a way. They financed her move to London, where she lived in an empty office and record uh, in a recording studio. She would clean the office, sweeping the floors and uh, dusting and stuff as rent, so that she could basically learn the music industry. She never didn't record anything of her own there, but she recorded it with backup vocals and stuff for other musicians. So in 1985, she returned to LA and signed with A&M Records, and she began working with David Ricketts. David Ricketts was one of the members of David plus David, the other David being David Bearwald. So I was not very familiar with David plus David, but I will say this. David Ricketts helps really helps launch Tony Child's career, mm. but he is the least he is the lesser successful David of David and David because <laughs> David Berwald would go on to help launch Cheryl Crow's career. <laughs> so uh, gonna weigh it out here and say Cheryl Crow's the winner. <laughs> but back to Tony, the first thing she would do with David Ricketts at a at A and M is the soundtrack for the film Echo Park. She would then provide backup vocals for David on David's, David and David, David plus David, or David and David's album, Boomtown, which I believe was their only album by the Davids. <laughs> so, but Boomtown actually did fantastic in Australia. And I bring that up. <laughs> because Tony Child's debut album, Union, would be released in 1988, and it would be released to critical acclaim, even though it would not produce any top 40 hits in the U.S. Despite not blowing up in the U.S., it would be huge in Australia and New Zealand. I mean, <laughs> huge, like double platinum. Her follow-up to Union was House of Hope, and even with the title track being featured in the movie Thelma and Louise, it did not sell well, guys. It did not sell well in the U.S. A&M Records actually would drop her after that because, it, to date, it's only sold about 203,000 copies. But it went like double platinum in Australia and New Zealand. Like, it was huge in Australia. <laughs> So she'd get another chance at the U.S. audience. She would sign with a Geffen subsidiary called DGS, or I'm sorry, DGC. She would release her next album, The Woman's Boat. And despite featuring friend of Vice music, Gabriel, guys, it still sold poorly in the U.S. <laughs> uh, and even despite some critics giving it some high marks, yeah, to date, it's only sold about 66,000 units in the U.S., Unfortunately, she would be dropped from her U.S. label again, but it would do huge in Australia and New Zealand. So she still got that Aussie money coming in, baby. The Aussie. Give it her money. So she would release the very best of Tony Childs. 
which would be the fifth best-selling album of 1996 in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Just killing it. Just killing it. You know, and it made me think about, I don't really re know what they, I cannot for the life of me place what they call money in Australia. I so, think it's just dollars. Uh, is it dollars? I, I yeah. know it's got to be something ridiculous. It, it's it's got to be like, <laughs> like, I, I, like, it's got to be like, like here's five Dundees and a Wambuku, <laughs> you know? <laughs> couple wallabies. I mean, come, yeah, a couple wallabies. Like, it, it's got to have a ridiculous name. So she's rolling in the wallabies right now. <laughs> It's got more D's and Walla Blues than you would ever believe. <laughs> Unfortunately, she would retire from music in 1997. She actually, she was diagnosed with Graves' disease, which is a form of hyperthyroidism. Uh, and it would actually prompt her to, to start a charity, the charity called, a charity called Dream a Dolphin. Since 2004, she has pretty much recovered from Graves' disease. She would begin performing again and actually started recording again, including the album Keeping the Faith. Hopefully that trend continues and maybe you can catch Tony Childs it, or the next time she's touring Australia or New Zealand. You can go and grab a show. I'm sure you can find tickets to a show in Sydney right now. Dude, so uh, by the way, she did move to Australia eventually, but she actually up until about 2012 lived in Hawaii. <laughs> then she moved to Australia, you know, during the great comeback tour. There's well, your music. I don't think we have enough didgeridoos to keep this section going. <laughs> we got to get our final thoughts. <laughs> All right, John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? All right, so season five kicked off with a bang. This is a strong episode to start the season on, and it is making promises that I'm not sure season five will eventually deliver. <laughs> so, but I'm excited. I'm excited. I love <laughs> Evil Burnett. I love Evil Burnett. And the best thing, and I think the thing that you that easily gets missed in this episode, because there's there there's definitely some stuff that's being left for the third one. And one of the things that left is that there is still several missiles out there that have not been used yet. And if we know Vice, something is getting blown up. So, and those are just just out there. Like we didn't see them through the rest of the episode. They mentioned this, the the missiles being stolen. We haven't seen them come back yet. And on top of the missiles, it's getting to the turn. I mean, they left us on the cliffhanger. Rocket just killed them. Did he just shoot him again? Did he actually remember? And he, it, uh, we have no idea what's going on or what's going to happen when he comes out of that lighthouse. But right now, it's looking like a dead, another dead partner. For Crockett, I am super juiced with the way this season has started. I am totally digging Evil Burnett, and I kind of want to see him take over. I kind of <laughs> want to see how the rest of it ends because I feel like we we are stuck halfway in this plan, and the whole second the whole second half of his plan is about to unfold. And I think Old El Gato is going to be surprised how everything goes on. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm actually going to be disappointed when we have to go back to seeing Sunny as a police officer if that ever happens uh and i want more of the power of ponytail <laughs> melissa what are your final thoughts on this episode i love the ponytail <laughs> <laughs> that's all i care about no. i love this episode it's a great episode i love season five so i'm very excited to get started on season five i'm kind of sad that the amnesia is going to come to an end soon the arc the story arc because i think it's such a great like it's a great deviation from the regular Miami Vice, where they're just like the the uh, episode to episode, they're doing the same kind of stuff. So I'm excited for it to finish, but at the same time sad because it's, we don't have we don't get any more Sunny Ponytail. <laughs> then it's just a really bad mullet. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. I, I I like the the third episode or the whatever. I guess it's, what is it like? Is it the fourth episode? Or it's the third. The third episode, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I like this episode, and I'm you know I I'm sad for Celeste because I know she really loves him. And she thinks he's going to stay with her forever. Apparently, she doesn't understand how amnesia works. <laughs> She's going to have to figure that out. Because <laughs> he's going to come to of it and remember well, who I mean, he is. Celeste kind of sounds like Caitlin. So, I mean, maybe we can make an exception. <laughs> I don't know how you turn around. Like, how do you come out of that? 
he's murdered a lot of people in cold blood. He's calculated. He's murdered. He, yeah, like, how could Tubbs be like, you know what? I could totally trust you to have my back. I mean, just that one time you hit your head. <laughs> you weren't right for days. But also, it kind of bought, uh, the only thing that bothered me about this episode, and um, me and you discussed it earlier, is that you don't really know how much time has passed between when he took off with that boat to now. Has it been six months? Has it been a month? Has it been a year? I mean, how did this all happen? How did he find Celeste? How did she, was she already married to, to Carrera and then he like corrupted her? Or did he like plan this whole thing? She married Carrera that fast? And it, that's very confusing to me, that part. Questions, lots of questions. <laughs> mm. Well, I agree with you guys. This is a really great episode. I really love how this arc is going. If I still don't consider the Hackman story being the first part of this. No, I don't either. Even though it's included in it, and I understand why some people would include it in here is because he like, it's when he snaps and then you add in the explosion and then he really does think like he did something out of character and then he almost dies, which makes him into that character. But I still don't consider that. So this is really the second part of this story. In every good story and every good book and every good story, what happens is the heroine or the hero or the main plot person ends up in a part of the story where it seems like he is up against insurmountable odds and that there is absolutely no way as a reader watching or reading this that they will be able to recover from this. And this is why everyone loves Empire Strikes Back in the Star Wars story. They are buried. They are done. Luke almost dies. Here we are in Miami Vice. It seems insurmountable that there is absolutely no way that Sonny can ever recover from this. This is why we're all here, because we know that in the next episode, it's make or break, man. It's make or break. Either he's going to snap out of it or he's not. And the Vice team is going to have to do something that they don't want to have to do. And to be honest with you, as being the first time viewer on the show, I have no idea what to expect in the next episode. They have me on pins and needles. If only it didn't take place in a season gap. I think that's a huge miss for the show that they did this as a cliffhanger as the end of season four and then picked it up as season five. In this time period, you know how hard it would be to go back and watch the fir the first episodes of this story arc? Like, Hopefully they showed it as reruns if you happen to catch it. This story arc is like made for the binge movement of our era right now. Like that you would then go mm -hmm. on to the next episode. The only question I have that I'm going to leave it on is, and me, me and Melissa were talking about this. What is happening with the rest of Sonny's family? Where are they? Where's Timmy, Johnny, Billy, Billy? Where's Billy? What's happening with his ex-wife? What happens with Caitlin's extended family? Her record contracts, like all of this stuff. While he's out murdering people, then when he comes back, like, how does he recover all of that stuff, too? Yeah. Because he's essentially mm -hmm. a millionaire now. He's a for real millionaire because of yes. Caitlin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, granted, he's never had visitation, nor has he wanted visitation with <laughs> little Bobby. But I, I see your point about everything else. I mean, the mail stacking up. He, ha he has a mansion to think about. Doesn't he have parents? Yeah. Like, they never talk about that. Like, do they have a mom and dad? Is, do we, is he an orphan? <laughs> Does he have old army buddies that are wondering where he's at? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. We would love, love, love to hear from you. Email us, GoWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Get us on Twitter at Go With The Heat. Instagram at Go With The Heat. Facebook.com slash Go With The Heat. That I mentioned, you can pretty much find us anywhere at Go With The Heat, including GoWithTheHeat.com. That's where you can go to the website. You can find all the ways to contact us, all the ways that you can subscribe to the show. We are on Anchor. If you'd like to listen to us on there, you can listen to us on that podcast platform of choice. We're on every podcast platform. You name it. Shoutcast, Overcast, Pocketcast. <laughs> you name it. We're on there. And you know what? The number one way that you can support the show, go to that podcast or platform of choice, iTunes, and give us a five-star rating. No one reads the review so don't bother writing a review and no one will ever know i told you to go and give us five stars so just give us five stars five pineapples <laughs> six bananas whatever the <laughs> highest rating is on your podcast your platform of choice go in there and write a review you can also you can also throw us some wallabies or maybe <laughs> we're not asking for a whole lobster i mean we're not crazy <laughs> But not, maybe not a pineapple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But maybe like a pineapple, you know, uh, if you go to our Patreon, you know, a couple, yep. couple wallabies, a pineapple. 
like a pine cone, <laughs> pine cone 50. <laughs> Support step number one, go to that podcast platform, leave us five stars, write a review about how much you love Sonny's ponytail. Write that review about his ponytail. Then two, go check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pals.